Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Friday, June 2nd, 2017 edition of VR News. Sadly, no exity tonight. Uh, we've been trying to hook up, test the webcam thing, and resurrect gaming Fridays. He's been very busy. He's got a new position. And, of course, uh, I've been doing my running around as well. So, hopefully, you know, one of these gaming Fridays, it's resurrected. I can't wait. Miss my bro a lot. Uh, but with that said, let's jump into the first story. Concerning game called Nemesis perspective and it's another example of an asymmetrical multiplayer vr game and i love these panoptic is another example you've got one person that is enjoying the vr experience another using conventional controls and visual media and it's usually in an effort to frustrate stop harass etc the vr person and this game is no exception except in this one i think the concept is even cooler the VR person is playing a typical end game boss style thing, right? You know, what you'd see in a Dark Souls or a raid boss from an MMO, basically this big blue Hulk. And you see the creature's waist up. So from the VR perspective, you're using your big massive arms to punch, slap, grab and crush the other player. The other player is using a gamepad and just a regular monitor. So love that. Would love to see this type of a game with a lot of resources thrown at it just to see what the result would be, right? Because I love the idea uh, and this definitely piqued my interest. So like, again, that's Nemesis Perspective. Uh, $8 US HTC Vive only at this point, unfortunately, but it is available right now. So if you've got buddies and you're looking for a fun co-op style game or adversarial co-op, right? This would be a game to give a shot to. Not a bad price. Next news story, London, as in uh, London, UK, not Canada, getting its first full-scale virtual reality arcade. And can't wait to see what they're going to come up with. Uh, it's a company called DNA VR. And they've already got 25, a combination of 25 games and experiences locked up. They mentioned a few, uh, Everest uh, experience, Tilt Brush, Trials on Tatooine. I'm hoping the balance are, you know, fun, meaty experiences because this is London. And look, London, probably one of those cities in the world, right up there, it's a New York for Europe, just like Paris, right? And some other cities where the reach goes way beyond the locals. Sure, there's probably going to be some London uh, locals, but there could be people from all over the UK visiting London that are going to try it from all over Europe, Asia, Africa, uh, you name it. They're going to be in London checking it out. Talk about marketing for VR. Just wonderful. Really good news to see something open up there. Uh, when they're open, I'm going to try to report back on that just to get an idea of the aesthetics. I'm hoping, hoping they're going for the Japanese approach of really theming it up and making it something special, not just, you know, because I've had people say, and they got a point, the sparseness also can send that message. Look, you're entering VR from a very bland, drab environment, and then you're going into something special. And I get that. But it would also be cool to have it just be awesome, decked out, themed out, and then go into your cool VR experience, right? Uh, no word on the exact timeline for that, uh, just that they're going to be using HTC Vives and they've secured roughly 25 games and experiences. Next up, a company called Mind Maze has a facial recognition technology. It relies on muscle twitches, but not the conventional route via cameras. It's using sensors. And the good news is potentially this can be a lot cheaper. The bad news is it's not as accurate. In fact, if you look at the video that I've supplied below, you can see how much actually gets missed. Now, to be fair, uh, the company Mind Maze does state that, look, the program will learn over time. So just because it missed your blink now or your frown or whatever, uh, you would calibrate and build up that catalog first, 
And then once you have that, then you go on and play those games or experiences relying on those uh, expressions. So hopefully that's true and the case. Uh, I love seeing innovative approaches to stuff like facial tracking, but I do think that cameras and other types of sensors that don't rely on just you know muscle fiber twitches probably the better way to go for now next up sony and samsung leading according to idc which is the international data corporation leading worldwide vr market shares and even without these numbers Pretty sure most of us were aware of that. I've been harping on Samsung all week on the uh, you know enviable position that they're in for VR. This just substantiates that. So according to IDC, Samsung has shipped 490,000 Gear VRs the first three months of 2017. So half a million units, giving them approximately a 21 0.5% market share. Now this is overall VR, right? Uh, you could look at that and say, yeah, well, that's just mobile. And you'd be right. That would be my thinking too. But just keep in mind, this is overall virtual reality percentages. Second, Sony, probably also no surprise. They come in second with 429,000 PlayStation VR shipped. And then third, HTC, probably would have guessed that too. Uh, a little bit lower their number, basically 191,000 units moved in the first three months. So if you take most of these companies at their word that they want to grow VR five to 10 years, that's not a bad number. Uh, I would have liked to have seen that at about half a million for Vive. I would have been a lot happier with that number. Uh, you know, be on pace for a couple of million units for 2017. But look, on the PC side of things, given its price point, still not that bad. And then after that, we've got the Oculus Rift at 100,000 units for January, February, March of 2017. So you can click on the link, dive into those statistics a bit more if you want. I will have that in the description below. All right, next news story. Uh, this, the original news story, it's from the website for the British Journal of Photography. And it's about Udacity. And Udacity is an online degree program for VR programming, photography, uh, you know, video, that sort of thing. Um, six months. Not so sure you can pull off programming. If the idea here is, look, you get the degree, but you're expected to then apprentice, self-apprentice or whatever, for another couple of years, sure. But as someone with a comp side degree, I can tell you programming is very involved. And if it's not something you do as a hobby, you need to sink a lot more time than once or twice a week for six months to become, you know, proficient enough that you could churn out something halfway decent so uh, but I like the idea but anyways that wasn't what excited me about the article what excited me about the article was the lead-in story right has to do and the name's not important but with a British businessman who felt he wasn't spending enough time with his children right he had a job photography uh, well photography was his hobby but I think he's sold cameras and had to travel a lot. So he was looking for something he could do with his kids and he stumbled upon EverQuest, affectionately known as Evercrack once upon a time because it's it was very highly addictive, right? So I, the irony there, yeah, kind of didn't escape me, the fact that to communicate with his kids, he basically got them addicted to an MMO. But with that said, the story's pretty cool because he was able to get into conversation with his kids through EverQuest that he wasn't even able to data mine from them in person or on the phone. So for him, it worked, right? You know, who your friend, tell me about your friends and school and all that kind of stuff where generally kids are going to give you one word answers, right? He was able to get a lot more because really, if you think about it, it catered to kind of the millennial generation in that short and sweet texting style, right? When you're chatting, uh, it was online, wasn't face to face. It's actually pretty brilliant. So I love that. But what I really like is the pictures the guy took because 
The thing about, and I've played a couple of online MMOs, you never know what the person is like. You get this idea in your head of what they look like on the other side of the keyboard, and you're usually way off, right? You might get a deep voice and picture a lumberjack of a guy who's seven feet tall, you know, wears, you know, Mac jackets, the plaid ones, uh, and, you know, can fell trees with a single axe swing. And then the, the person in real life, he's, you know, four foot 11, just happens to have a very deep voice, right? So yeah, you could be way off. So what he did is he created these pictures of people alongside their online avatar personas. And there's some really cool pictures here just to show you how diverse and powerful this gaming medium that we, most of us here enjoy is, right? And then it does tie into VR. Uh, there's another picture I'm gonna throw up where he basically created his own version, and we've seen others do this, but he was a little ahead of his time, 105 Nikon 36 megapixel cameras in this airport 360 scanner array, right? And with that, he claims he's able to create the most advanced avatars that he's ever seen or worked with. So love to see something like that go commercial or even just as an offering, right? Go there, get your avatar created, and then import that avatar into whatever game or experience you want. That would be pretty cool. If you want to know more about him, the story, the name, the links, check them out in the description below. All right, next up, a or an update rather on the Hapto device, which itself is a haptic feedback device. Uh, looked at this way back. Well, now they're closer. They've got an Indiegogo campaign. Uh, not so sure what I think about it. Well, rather, I am sure what I think about it. And my first impression is I'm not a big fan and I'm just not convinced it's gonna work that well. So what it uses, I believe it was five times six or five times five five rows of five little rubber tip nubs that go up and down. They will simulate the feeling of touching something in virtual reality. So they've got an early bird price, 129 US, the regular price 249, which I think is pretty steep for that kind of a device. But uh, look, they've got no financial backing. This is their means, fine. Uh, probably just not something I would personally be interested in as a haptic device, right? So, sorry, it is 20, so it's four rows of five. Uh, 20 rubber tup nibs that move up and down. Apparently, it's gonna work with Rift, Vive, and the Gear VR. Once again, Hapto, and they are getting pretty close. Indiegogo, for anyone who doesn't know, it's very much like Kickstarter. I believe the difference is if you don't meet... Uh, the required amount, or if you don't deliver, there's there's other stipulations. It's a bit more, you're a bit more locked in with obligations than you would be with Kickstarter. Uh, and that helps with the scams and things quite a bit. All right, next up, Occipital, launching a wireless tracking platform for VR headsets. I really liked looking at some of the products these guys have come up with. So they've got something called Bridge, which we've talked about also many months ago for iPhones. Uh, a product called Monoslam. It's a technology where, you know, with basically $20, $30 worth of Radio Shack or electronic parts, you can build this camera yourself use, that uses their software to basically provide inside out tracking. And the video does a really good job of showing you how walking around the room, the person is gradually able to map all the contents of that room for the inside out tracking experience. I still have concerns with controllers in an inside out situation, right? How accurate that's gonna be, how occlusion plays into that. But until we start seeing these things in the market, we're not gonna get those results, right? And answers to those questions. So yeah, their latest technology is working on something that all of the devices are gonna be able to use, all the major ones, to provide inside-out tracking. Now, unless a developer specifically caters to this, 
remember, it's probably going to be pretty next to useless unless you're a developer, you're using it for a project. Uh, expect even if it passes and it gets out there and, you know, you're able to start buying this thing, keep in mind you're probably not going to see a lot of support for it unless it really has a decent attach rate. And the uh, next and last story, love this one from Upload VR because it talks about the TP cast. And I've had all kinds of questions and concerns about this the last few days with all these other, you know, Vive entering partnerships with Intel, etc. This is finally Upload VR, somebody testing the TP cast at its ready for retail version. And it's pretty good. The results are pretty damn good. So first off, visual fidelity according to Upload VR's tester, really, really good. Uh, didn't notice, you know, any latency at all in multiple hours of testing this thing. There was some color compression issues, but that had to do with where the camera uh, was initially placed, or rather the receiver. Once it was put in a better position, that was eliminated, but something to keep in mind. Uh, sound quality, largely the same as wired HMD, so not really able to discern, you know, if there's a disadvantage there, etc. They had to use their own battery because the one that shipped with it to them was one that they had used, you know, multiple, multiple hundreds of times at various VR conferences and so forth. So they used an Ankar uh, 2100 battery, which lasted about four and a half hours of playtime. Uh, charging took about eight to 10 hours using a two amp charger. Using the actual battery, uh, you know, the charge time was much quicker. I believe it was three to four, uh, yeah, three and a half hours to charge, but the charge only lasted just shy of two hours. So one hour and 45 minutes. Now, battery indicator, unfortunately, uh, you know, to me it would be okay, but it's not super accurate. It basically has, there's four dots, and each dot is 25% battery life, right? So all four lit, full charge, three, you know, you've got 75% charge left, 250, one, it's 25% charge left, so... Uh, yeah, it sounds great. I love what I'm hearing about this. I know the cost is a little higher, uh, but I still want one, and I want one bad. They also addressed that question about the FCC. Now, according to the latest, TPCast HTC still chasing down the FCC to get a full definitive so they can start shipping this to the largest VR market on the planet. Until then... Either you order one from China or you wait like me patiently. So there you have it, guys. That is it. I finished the tour uh, videos, going to edit those and all the other stuff I promised uh, today, tomorrow. But it's coming. Guys, cheers. And have a hell of a good weekend.